Okay, great. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. It's so lovely to see you all. Can everybody hear me in the back? Okay. If you need me to speak more loudly, just signal or something. Right. Um, so most of you know me, uh, but if you don't, uh, my name is Dr. Vallejo. I'm in the music department. I'm associate professor in ethnomusicology. I'm also a faculty associate for the Weglin Endowed Chair. And part of the, one of the main sponsors for this event um, has been the Weglin Endowed Chair um, through uh, Dr. Mary Danico. Um, before we get started, I just want to make sure I say thank you to our classes who are here with Dr. Jeff Roy. Thank you. Um, and then also some of my students. And I see Dr. Uh, Lorraine Hong here. So uh, thank you so much. And um, I want to thank the CPP Library, uh, Music Department, Liberal Studies, and um, and everybody who helped make this possible and this whole speaker series possible. So Weglin has speaker series every year focused on um, social justice issues. And we just had uh, three last week, and now um, we'll have some more in May. So make sure you keep an eye out for everything. Um, and basically, uh, real quick, the Weglin series uh, is made possible by an endowment by Mitchie and Walter Weglin. And um, this was with the support of our past president, Bob Suzuki and his partner, Agnes. And uh, Mitchie Weglin and Walter Weglin were very dedicated to social justice. They both were survivors of um, really difficult situations. So Mitchie Weglin had been, um, was a survivor of the Japanese internment camps and Walter Weglin was a survivor of the Holocaust. They met in New York City and um, they both dedicated a lot of their personal advocacy work to social justice issues and making sure that we make this a better world for everybody um, now and later. So a lot of their work in, a, um, in their lives has been dedicated to this. And so that's what our speaker series focuses on. Um, and you know, building community and discussion, discussing and sharing issues about how to center social justice. Um, now, I want to introduce our guest speaker today, um, Dr. Elise Manuel Garcia Mispireta, and um, he's an associate professor in ethnomusicology and pop music, uh, pop music studies at the University of Birmingham in uh, the UK, in England. So he's traveled real far and he's doing this awesome book tour. We're so excited he squeezed in time to see us. Um, I met Luis Manuel, initially through his work in social justice, I think trying to make um, our field of ethnomusicology a safer space for everybody to um, help make sure that many of us who come from backgrounds that um, were often studied <laughs> um, can feel included in a high, place of higher education. And I know he's, he's done a lot of behind the scenes leadership in making sure that we create safer, kinder spaces, de-escalate issues and just center justice for everybody um, involved. And um, I know a lot of his work has also been focused on queer spaces and for QTPOC. And um, it just works really well with thinking about music, safe space, social justice. And um, I really wanted to bring him here to talk with our students, many of you who come from backgrounds that, um, you know, you have your own experiences with a lot of these issues, and I'm sure it will be personal to you in many ways. And finally, I just want to mention that he's such a phenomenal writer and scholar. Um, you know, I, I read his book, and I'm sure some of you are here because you read his book. Some of you will go home with a book today. And um, I think it's an amazing example of making sure what we write in the academy resonates with our our community, right? That anybody who's going to these spaces and dancing to EDM or house music will read this and feel like, wow, this is so interesting. I like I can relate to this, right? So if you are doing any research for any of your classes, his book and his his um, articles are just a really great example of great methods and a great way to connect with community. Um, and if it's your first time ever hearing about ethnomusicology, I think that. Um, his book is a good example of what I wish we had in grad school. Um, I can only imagine if we read a book like yours in our early seminars, what that could be doing to shape our careers. So I'm really glad that um, younger ethnomusicologists are being able to learn from that. And so if you read any book and you want an introduction to ethnomusicology, please make sure you get his book today or later if we run out of free copies. But 
I want to leave now the talk to Dr. Elise Manuel, uh, Garcia Mispereta, and thank you so much for being here. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Vallejo, for that, uh, I mean, fantastic, glowing, uh, extremely flattering introduction. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Apologies, I'm also recovering from uh, from a sinus cold that turned into a chest cold. It is both not COVID, most importantly, and also I'm well past being contagious. I just sound disgusting. So please be, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, please be patient with me. I have lidocaine laced cough drops. I have a bottle of water. We're going to do our very best. Um, and also, uh, I mean, I really want to thank the the Weglin family as well for for funding this. You know, like in general, the the fund uh, that resonates really deeply with me, specifically as somebody who is, uh, you know, broadly very broadly defined, yes, Latino, um, but more in more detail. I'm I was born in Canada, grew up in Canada, but to a family that was half Peruvian, half Colombian. Uh, and from the Colombian side of the family, who's from Arjona, which is uh, very close to Cartagena, and so he's a costeño. Um, that side of the family is also Sephardi Jewish. Uh, and in particular, part of the story of my grandmother on that side um, was being the Sephardi Jewish um, and the sole heiress to a cattle ranch and then doing the thing that she was not supposed to do, which was marrying a Gentile mestizo uh, farm worker instead of the man that she was supposed to marry uh, and paying a lot of consequences for essentially marrying mm -hmm. across ethnic boundaries and religious boundaries for mm -hmm. marrying outside of the community in these various ways. Uh, and that's part of my history as well uh, is these sort of cross, you know, cross community um, connections. So um, yeah, so for, for, for me as well, that's, that seems really relevant and really resonant. So with that, um, and without much further ado, I'm gonna get started. Uh, so my understanding here is that quite a lot of the folks, at least physically here in the room, have read some parts of the book, uh, which is great, thank you so much. Uh, and nonetheless, though, I'm gonna give a little bit of framing of what the whole project is, uh, like the project behind the book, for those of you who maybe haven't read it, uh, and also for those out there in, in streaming land who, you know, for whom this might be still a new thing. Um, and I'll try to keep to time as well. The whole format of this, it's not going to be a formal academic talk. I'm not going to be reading like a, a prepared speech. I'm going to read a few sections from the book, and in particular, I'm going to be focusing on storytelling. I'm going to be focusing on bits in the book where I'm, where I'm sharing um, ethnographic anecdotes or ethnographic vignettes, uh, and then I'll unpack them a little bit for you. Uh, so I, I will admit that I'm cheating a little bit in the sense that I'm focusing on the fun parts of the book. Although of course the whole book is fun, take, you know, take my word for it. But um, I'm gonna focus on the storytelling bits and then do some unpacking and sort of point towards where I go with my arguments and my analysis of those stories. Uh, and for time, and I say this, I'm gonna make sure my phone is like facing up. Um, I'm gonna, my, my target is to reserve a bit of time towards the end to read from and reflect on the last part of the book, right? So the, the the last bit of the book is an epilogue. It's a short epilogue. And as part of that epilogue, I spend a bit of time reflecting on um, the Pulse Orlando shooting, right? So queer and specifically, you know, Lat you know Latinx or Latina queer uh, nightlife, what that means, you know, for those communities and what it means to them have the, that community intact in the way that it was in 2016. So I'm going to try to reserve time to make sure we get to that. Um, and maybe one other thing to signal again for those of you who get the book, um, especially those of you who are maybe thinking about uh, continuing on past your undergraduate studies into MA and maybe into PhD work. Um, the preface of the book, uh, I wrote specifically in a very particular way. You know, typical, typically for academic books, the preface of the book is where you're supposed to tell the story of how the book was made. Right. So you're not telling you're not summarizing the book, but you're saying like this book was started in this year. And, you know, I worked with these people and this is how I got it to publication. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's in there. But also I wanted to be really transparent about all the things that went wrong, all the, the obstacles I faced, um, you know, and not just in a kind of a victim narrative, but just like how hard it is to make this thing happen. Uh, and especially to be really clear about all the ways that um, all the ways that it is extra hard to be um, a grad student or, or to be an academic, try, trying to have a career in academia when you are first generation, when you are, you know, QT POC, you know, when you were, you know, career trans folks of color, however that is defined very broad, broadly, um, you know, and especially like all the challenges that come with trying to build a career in an institution that wasn't made for people like you, right? And what, what that means. 
Um, so I'm not going to go into that in detail here, but if that's if you're thinking about going further into academia, um, I very much encourage you to take a look at the preface. It's really short. There's also a little bit of like spilling of tea as well. It's all, you know, I do, I do, you know, for those of you who, for those who know, there's some mention of some bits in there that I think are interesting. I have a whole acknowledgement section, but also a disacknowledgement section, which I think is spicy and well worth reading. Um, and that is available for free. So even if you don't get the book, uh, if you go to the website where, to the universe or the Duke University website, the publisher's website, and you find my book there, um, they offer the, the the whole intro section of the book for free as like a sample PDF sample. So you can download that for free as a PDF. It gives you the table of contents. It gives you the preface and also the very first chapter, which is a long chapter. That's one I'm going to read from the opening of that intro chapter now. Um, and that intro... It opens with an anecdote, which is kind of playing into the stereotypes of anthropologists in general, but especially I think ethnomusicologists and cultural anthropologists, which is that we just, you know, we structure everything around storytelling and anecdotes and so on. Uh, and like guilty is charged. Um, I'll read a bit of this opening anecdote and unpack it a little bit. Uh, and then from there, we'll sort of jump around the book a bit and see how time goes from there. Um, so I didn't promise that I was going to introduce the book proper, so I'll do that. I'll do that just to give you the sense of the, the topic here, right? So I'm also trained like Dr. Rayo in, in ethnomusicology, so ethnographic approaches to music studies. Um, I was initially trained in more kind of classical music stuff, but excuse me, I had always been um deeply involved in the rave scene. So I was involved in electronic music club culture from really early on. Um, when I was a teenager in high school in the 1990s. Uh, that was also part of the story of me coming out was also going to raves and finding a space that was not high school and that was not those sort of social you know um, circles where I could go and be a different version of myself that felt more authentic to me and so on right so these are all kind of important parts of my narrative um and it wasn't until later in school actually it wasn't until I was a master's student that I transitioned from being more of a kind of a classical music nerd and somebody who's going to be studying that to doing work on popular music and more specifically on electronic music. Uh, and at that time, there weren't many of us doing that, you know, at any level. Um, there still aren't that many of us, uh, but at the time, certainly I could have counted on one hand the other like published scholars who would doing work on rave culture and popular culture. So that is changing. Uh, I'm very happy to see that changing uh, and definitely I encourage more people to contribute to that changing. Um, so for this book itself, it was, this comes in my PhD project. It was ethnographically researched in three different cities. So it's a multi-site project or multi-sided project. I was looking at the techno scenes between 2006 and 2010 in Chicago, which is where I was studying. I was at the University of Chicago at the time for my PhD um, in Paris and in Berlin. Uh, there's a whole other story that, you know, if, if anybody wants to ask me about later, I'm happy to tell about how I ended up adding those three cities, but it was very much just based on where I could get funding, uh, you know, where what I could access and what languages I already spoke, right? Uh, and in all of those instances, part of the story, again, part of the story of moving through academia without the resources that are usually presumed um, for you to have, um, you know, part of that challenge was me having to sort of build a project out of what resources, like what I could access, right? So I could access Chicago because I lived there. And then I eventually, I eventually accessed uh, Paris and Berlin, um, not quite by luck, but you know, I found the funding, the pockets of funding first, and then decided, oh, okay, I guess I'm adding this to my project as well, right? So, um, so we'll go from there. We'll start from there. Ah, and one last thing as well, topic-wise, right? So I'm looking at these three cities. I'm looking at dance music. Um, from 2006 to 2010, that was a period when minimal house and minimal techno as sub-styles were the dominant styles. So I'm mostly really talking about those scenes. Historically, this is kind of the last years before the EDM boom, right? So a lot of you probably will have lived memory of the 2010s EDM boom, uh, especially here in North America, right, in the U.S. And this, the research for this book was happening before this, right? So when still techno parties were quite small, when there were no big EDM festivals or only a few, uh, and where, broadly speaking, uh, you know, like your, your larger circle of friends mostly wouldn't know what techno was or wouldn't care about it and would probably have very negative stereotypes about it, right? This was at a time when still a lot of this stuff was underground in some ways, right? So... Um, with that, the last thing to think about, or for me to signal as I go into this, are the keywords or the themes, right, of this, of this project. Yes, I was interested in dance music in these three cities, and I was interested specifically in intimacy, 
right? And I was interested in stranger intimacy. So that was the thing that fascinated me about these scenes. And it was part of what was so meaningful for me when I was getting into these scenes as a teenager, was that these were places where I could go as somebody who was pretty introverted at school and definitely experienced a lot of isolation um, in, you know, in my um, educational environment. And I could go to these spaces and connect with people that I didn't know. And actually, a lot of that connection and a lot of those those moments were with people that I didn't know and I wouldn't know afterwards, right? That these were, some people became friends, but a lot of these were just fleeting contact on the dance floor, in the chill out room, waiting for the toilets, that kind of a thing, just chatting with folks, uh, exchanging glances on the dance floor, right? And sometimes that was also like romantic or erotic, but most of the time it wasn't. Most of the time it was just sharing a dance floor, being really into the music and having these moments. And so the, a lot of this book is trying to figure out how does that happen, right? And why does that happen in these scenes? And in particular for me, um, who's experiencing and kind of comparing my experiences with other music scenes as a, as a teenager, at least, why did this scene seem like one where these sort of intimate interactions were more possible, right? Or easier to do, easier to have, right? Like, why was that possible? What does it say about electronic music, a rave culture? What does that say about dancing? What does that say about bodies in a room, about drugs, about sexuality, all these things, right? So with that, finally, let's get to the intro. I'm gonna read the opening paragraph, which isn't yet storytelling. So just I'm gonna read the paragraph to you. This sets up the whole book. Um, and okay. for those of you, especially who are thinking about academic writing, um, hopefully you can also see some of the some of the, the the structural writing that's going on here as well, right? Um, you know, not to toot my own horn, but <clears throat> excuse me, I try to set up like, why does this matter? What's the point? What are the main themes? Uh, what are the problems I'm trying to address, right? And then try to signal or telegraph a little bit of the structure. So I'll read the first intro or the first paragraph, and then I will jump to the actual opening anecdote and tell you a bit of that as well, all right? So here we go. So <clears throat> the tricky thing, the tricky thing about dance floors is that they are places where both inclusion and exclusion happen. Whether subtle or conspicuous, club cultures always find ways to signal who is welcome to join in the dance. Electronic music scenes or dance music scenes tend to emphasize their inclusivity while downplaying their exclusions. And this tendency can be traced back to their subcultural origins. All right, so here I'm highlighting how dance music culture often, there's a lot of these tropes like plur, inclusion, everybody's welcome. And like, I don't wanna say that those are disingenuous because often they are earnestly meant when they are being said, but also in these same spaces, people do get excluded, right? And harassment happens and assault happens and like bad things happen and not everybody actually gets to be included. And a large part of this book is making sense of that, right? It's like that kind of a gap between what is subculturally super important for this, this culture um, or for this, this musical scene, and then what is actually kind of possible and practicable when it comes to like gathering strangers in a room, packing them full in a dark room with really loud music and expecting them to get along, right? So, so uh, electronic dance music scenes tend to emphasize their inclusivity while downplaying their exclusions. And this tendency can be traced back to their subcultural origins, dot, dot. From the, from the clandestine queer of color dance parties of early disco to the maths gatherings of suburban youth in the 1990s rave era, these scenes share a history of utopian longing for radically open inclusivity, especially for those who experience exclusion everywhere else in society, right? So like I'm highlighting here how in particular the these this kind of experience or the the kind of experiences of connection and inclusion that club cultures offer or can offer are especially meaningful precisely for those who don't experience that kind of inclusion in everyday life right or who especially experience a lot of marginalization and i'm leading to a point with that that we'll come to a little bit later around kind of the the cruel irony of some of that right as far as then in marginalized folks going to these spaces to experience this inclusion and then sometimes finding exclusion happening there too, right? That like these nightlife spaces are utopian spaces sometimes, but they're also, sometimes they, they betray our expectations. So as a result, these music scenes avoid focused talk about who belongs and how. Instead relying on vague references to shared musical tastes, open-mindedness and good vibes, right? So this strategic vagueness, and this is a, a phrase I use a lot through the book, strategic vagueness, this strategic vagueness is both a help and a hindrance, enabling dancers to, to, to temporarily enjoy a moment of belonging unburdened by the difficult work of identity politics, right? This, the difficult work of identifying belonging along lines of identity, while at the same time enabling them to ignore the exclusions and injustices that are taking place on those same dance floors. 
So such vagueness helps to sustain social worlds that can feel exhilaratingly expansive and yet also um, precarious, right? Liable to disintegrate as soon as their underlying tensions are exposed. So this is again highlighting for me, at least I'm trying to signal how vagueness, this kind of vagueness that I'm going to theorize through the whole book is, is kind of a lubricant, right? Like it lubricates stranger intimacy that makes it possible for people to belong to a dance floor or to feel like they belong to a dance floor full of strangers. Um, but it's also really fragile. It can fall apart really easily, right? You just need one bad interaction. And then that whole sense of, of stranger intimacy can really fall apart. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so here's the question. Here's like the question of the book, the problem. How do dancers get along in these fluid social contexts where learning the details of other dancers' identities, values, and political affinities risks undermining their utopian fantasy of universal togetherness? Right. And here, kind of what I'm also hinting at is sometimes you sometimes you might have this experience where um, you're vibing with other folks, having a great time, maybe connecting, what have you. And then somebody does open their mouth and say something about their political uh, values or their affinity, uh, you know, affinities, or even kind of what social class they're from or whatever. And then you're suddenly like, ah, we are not in community, actually. Right? Or like, ah, we're actually not that connected. Uh, and that's part of the experience I want to talk about here, right? Um, is how that we, we move through those experiences. So finally, the end of this intro, uh, of this paragraph, this book takes dance floor utopianism seriously, and in so doing, works to push electronic dance music scenes in the direction of those dreams. Uh, and that actually, I realize now, kind of that the phrasing of that last sentence is low key a call forward to like the closing of the book. So you know, get the book so you can see so you can see the connections. Um, so now I'm going to skip ahead to the opening anecdote here. Uh, and it's kind of hard to show visually to everybody, but when you get a book, you can see this. Um, I had a whole thing that I negotiated with the publisher so that when I'm doing the storytelling, so you can kind of see it here and here, this, all the, the anecdotes are in different format. So the, the text is slightly different or slightly smaller, line spacing, indented, kind of like a big block quotation in an essay. Uh, and always at the top of the anecdote, I have this kind of line of information that says exactly where this happened, what date, what time, so on. This all comes from my field notes. So some of this is also just being transparent about how anthropologists take notes, right? And then work with their notes. Uh, but also I kind of liked this idea of having, of switching voice, of code switching, which you know also is a very Latino thing, right? Or a very migrant thing to, to switch between languages or switch between registers of voice. So there are times when I am in my like academic time, uh, voice and other times when I'm just telling a story and then I unpack the story afterwards. So this is all storytelling. So I'm in Berkheim Panorama Bar, which is in Berlin. Uh, this was Sunday, July the 26th in 2008. Uh, and importantly, this is at four in the morning, which is early for Berlin club night, right? So this is not yet peak hour, but we're kind of getting to it. So here I am. <laughs> I was, I was dancing in the middle of Panorama Bar, part of the Berkheim nightclub complex. Uh, and I'm going to skip over a couple sentences where I just describe the nightclub contracts, uh, the, the nightclub's architecture and so on. That's me being overly descriptive for, you know, anthropological reasons, right? But I'm in Berkheim and more importantly, I'm in the Panorama Bar uh, space and I'm about halfway up. In the, in the... I was there to see, and by see, of course, I mean dance and listen to an artist named Heartthrob, otherwise known as Jesse Siminski, um, a recording artist signed to the high-profile minimal music label Minus, which is still around. So he had he had been booked at Panorama Bar as part of a tour showcasing his most recent album-length release, which was called Dear Painter, Paint Me. Came out in 2008 as well. So he was on tour, much like me, but he was touring his album. And, and so his performance that night featured a lot of the sonic materials from his album. Uh, while also reproducing the the overall style of the album, right? So it's kind of a half improvised set, but he was using musical rip materials, the kind of the stems from the tracks that he produced for the album. So to describe it, right, the sound included long, sustained, atmospheric washes of sound across the high frequency range, grounded by relatively low, resonant, but also punctuating, penetrating bass kick drums. Uh, and like many artists who are signed to this minimal techno label, Heartthrob's interpretation of minimal techno emphasized sparse textures and gradual change, all of them unfolding at a pace that was slow, even by the conventions of electronic dance music, a musical genre that primarily develops in cycles of 32 and 64 beats, right? So even for this kind of a genre where everything happens, where changes happen really gradually, this genre was really, really kind of slow. That was part of the, the style or the design, right? The, the, the BPM, the, the beats per minute were maybe fast, but 
how things change, like things would stay the same in one kind of a groove for a long time, and then layers would add, would come in and come and go away and so on, right? So that's just to give you a sense of these, the aesthetics. So typical of a summer Saturday night um, or Sunday morning at, at Panorama Bar in 2008, the crowd, hadn't, the crowd hadn't yet hit its peak, as packed as it was. I was about halfway back on the dance floor near the two-story windows that looked out over the Berlin skyline uh, and also into the entry queue below. So you could you could look out and see everybody queuing to get in. Sure. But nonetheless, I could only see, like I could, I could barely see beyond my arm's reach. So it was still so packed. And also I'm short uh, and Germans are tall. So, you know, I was mostly just seeing shoulders, right? Um, and so when a young man approached me, it seemed as if he had stepped out of a small, or out of a wall of shoulders. He had shoulder-length blonde hair, light skin, patches of glitter on his high cheekbones, a slim frame, and an outfit that combined an oversized white t-shirt with shiny Adidas athletic shorts and running shoes. This is kind of a look at that time. No longer, but it was a very cute look at the time. So he couldn't have been much more than about 25 years old, right? and I would have been 30-ish at the time, for what, that matters, for what that matters. So he had been in the process of pushing past me toward the bar, but he stopped to look me in the eyes, a smile on his lips. After a brief pause, he asked in German, alles klar, and I'll translate that in a second, because it's alles klar, and I, not entirely sure what he meant in this context, but reluctant, reluctant to impede the smoothness of our interaction, I smiled and I nodded, yeah, alles klar. His smile broadened as if that was all he wanted to hear from me, and then he caressed my face along the jawline from ear to chin like this, right? And continued pushing his way through the crowd, and I never saw him again. And that's the end of this opening story. Right? And then after this, I spent some time unpacking. Right? And, and I'll read a little bit of the unpacking because it's useful. It's what I would do anyways here. Right? So in this moment, alles klar, which means like literally everything clear, question mark. Right? But in German, alles klar is um, a way to sort of check in. It's, it's similar to like English, how are you? Or like, what's up? Um, and in particular in German, you, you don't, um, the, the, the more direct translation of how are you, wie geht's dir? Like, how are things going for you? Generally, you don't ask that unless you know the person kind of personally and you are ready to hear a detailed answer, right? <laughs> like, you don't say, wie geht's dir? And then the person's not going to be like, oh, yeah, good. Right? Like, this is, th that's not a thing you would do in a club environment. But this, saying, alles klar, which just means like, yeah, what's up? You know, but are you okay? Right? You okay? You doing fine? That's That was sort of the, the gist of it. But in the moment, I didn't, my German yet wasn't as solid. It wasn't solid enough. I was still recently arrived to Berlin for, for research. So in that moment, I actually didn't fully understand what he was saying, right? I knew there was a question, I knew he wanted an answer, and I did the thing that you often do when you're learning a language, which is you just sort of smile and nod and repeat it back, right? And for that one moment, it worked. So in that moment, alles klar, as a question, functioned as an opening to an exchange of surprising warmth between strangers, providing the setting for a tactile gesture that would have been entirely out of place on the street, right? In public, everyday urban life. So what transpired then was a moment of intimacy that was improvised on the basis of corporeal co-presence, right? Both of us in the room together, a shared sensorium, right? This kind of shared sense of, you know, listening to music, sweating, being packed in this room full of bodies, right? And also apparent aesthetic affinity. We were there for the same music. There's a bunch of assumptions that you could make about people who share the same musical tastes, maybe also connecting in other ways, right? And that, I get into that more in the book, right? Further in the book. So in other words, we were there in the flesh, sharing space, atmosphere, and sensuous enjoyment. And for whatever reason, that seemed to be enough, right? For him to feel comfortable doing this thing to me that definitely would have got his hand slapped anywhere else, right? Um, so this improvised intimacy succeeded in bringing, out, bringing about a fleeting connection, right? Despite the anonymity of the crowd. And in fact, and this is how, what I argue through the rest of the book, actually because of it, right? That something about the anonymity and the chaos and the flux of the crowd uh, in that context, not another context, but in that context, made it made it seem to him like he could do this gesture, right, and expect it to be either welcomed or at least tolerated, right? Um, and enough that for me, as the person receiving it, for me to not read that as like, oh, oh shit, I'm about to be assaulted, right, right, and instead to like roll with it. Um, so. This encounter was nonetheless risky, right? Starting from an utterance, what I, what he said, only half understood by me and followed by a series of kind of unscripted transgressions of polite decorum, right? Like he did end up transgressing what are kind of polite body norms by doing this, right? So things could have unfolded quite differently. For example, if I had recoiled at his touch, that would have been a really, you know, like that would have broken, absolutely busted the vibe, right? If he did this and I was like, uh, right? Uh, but I didn't. And 
even now, I can, I think back to that moment. And it was like cool and interesting, but also I could have flinched. I don't know why I didn't, right? And that's part of the story, right? And so yet, for all the potential of awkwardness and rejection, something brought us together somehow. And there's the title of the book. Ah, see, writers, <laughs> writer craft, right? Writer's craft. Get you know, get the title of the book into the opening anecdote. So that's already you know a fair bit of the opening, and I want to jump around a little bit. Right, looking at time. But I really wanted to spend some time with this opening anecdote, partially because partially it is one of my, my one of my favorite ones. It's one of the shortest ones too, um, but it still gets me to the main kind of point of the book, right? the main thing that interests me. Um, you know, as I go further into the book, there's another set of anecdotes that I would normally want to read if I had like a, if I was working with a slightly larger or longer time format. But I want to signal to folks um, who are interested if you go into chapter three right and so there's several different chapters here i kind of work from the first chapter to the last in a way where i'm moving outwards um i'm kind of starting with a really tight focus spatially and socially and then i work outwards from there so like chapter one is on touch and tactility on the dance floor it's just thinking about touch between strangers <laughs> excuse me and how that works on the dance floor and nowhere else, right? And then over time, like the next chapter is, is a kind of a more general reflection on tactility and sound. Chapter three, which is the bit I would be reading from, but I'm just going to summarize, is on what I call liquidarity, but which is kind of a pun on solidarity, right? It's kind of a form of solidarity between strangers that's more fluid and uncertain and both lubricating, but also, um, you know, vanishes, like you can't hold it in your hands, right? Like it's something that that's too fluid to capture. Um, and for that, I'm thinking about the dance floor, but also the interactions that happen at the bar, in the toilets, so on, right? Um, by uh, chapter four, I'm thinking about affect theory. I'm thinking about how music drive, can drive emotion. Um, and, and I'm thinking about how talking about music and emotion or, or how music impacts emotion um, on a personal level, how we can move from individual accounts of, of music and emotion to collective ones. Uh, and in a kind of a theoretically rigorous way that hopefully gets us or gets me at least to a place where I can be thinking about how collectively listening to music on a dance floor, um, where that music is sort of shaping emotional experience, right? It's shaping your affect, it's bringing you up, it's bringing you down, you're having buildups, you're having breakdowns, you're having all these sorts of things. <clears throat> Excuse me, by experiencing that in sync with other people, experiencing that at the same time on the dance floor where you're seeing each other, you're reacting, you're seeing each other's facial expressions and your hand gestures and so on. A lot of that um, is similar to stuff that we see in scientific uh, research studies of group behavior, in particular emotional contagion in group behavior, where um, all of us, it seems as humans, have these tendencies to sort of absorb other people's emotional states and project ours out through things like reading each other's facial expressions, bodily gestures, but also mirroring each other's movements right? Even when it's unconscious, all these sorts of things, right? So by the end of the chapter, I try to land at a theoretical place where I'm, where I'm suggesting that um, part of what makes uh, a stranger intimacy possible in these spaces is dancing together to the same music in a way that helps to bring you not just physically and musically in sync, but emotionally in sync to a place where then uh, it's possible to feel a sense of belonging and a sense of a, a, sense of a kind of community of strangers, even though there's not necessarily a clearly structured one in the way that you would expect from a more kind of stable um, social, a stable society of some sort, right? Like a, a kinship group or um, uh, like an ethnic community or something like that, right? So part of, again, part of what's, what's the, not the mystery, but the question um, for the whole book is how do we, you know, how can we have some of these rituals and practices of coming together and of connecting and socializing in contexts where you don't have the pre-existing social structures and hierarchies and traditions and practices that you would get in more established forms of community, right? And like how is so how does a dance floor make some of that possible? How does music make some of that possible? And so in chapter three, in part of that, or as part of that chapter, there's a section where I have like what I call a triptych of stories, like three stories back to back, all of them really short. And they're all from the same night. They're actually in this in the same club in Berkine as well. And there's three, like part of what was so memorable to me about these stories was going home afterwards and writing my field notes and realizing like, wow, these three different things happened to me in the same night, about two to three hours apart, each one. Um, and where with each one, it was an interaction with a, with a stranger or a couple of strangers, you know, everything from just a random dude on the dance floor next to me, um, kind of like exchanging uh, not even glances with me, but just like we were really vibing on the music, looking at each other at various points, kind of 
interacting as we were dancing, which I'm sure you've sort of seen folks do on the dance floor. We're not quite dancing with each other, but occasionally mirroring gestures or reacting to like big moments in the music together. And then by the end of it, he offered me his drink, um, which this is back at a time when you could do that or where, where that was a good idea or a reasonable <laughs> idea to do. It, it was a bottle of water also like we weren't losing or anything, but he, he offered me his bottle of water. I was like, thank you. You know, he said this like very cute thing in German, like, wichtig, which means like drinking is important. Uh, and he said it to me like, like a, you know, he was sort of making fun of what must have been a kind of a German parental kind of thing, right? He was sort of mimicking a parental voice being like, don't forget to drink. Uh, and then later that night, I did the same gesture back to right? Um, so there was another story where a dude just like sees me as I'm walking through the kind of smoking area slash like chill out area in between the two big club rooms. Uh, and this guy just grabs me and he's like, yo, you know, Marie, uh, we're both friends. You know, we're both friends of hers. And he used the name of a person that I that I was staying with in Berlin. So I was like, yeah, yeah, Marie. And then as he started talking about Marie, it became very clear he was talking about a completely different person. But he was, at that point, he was already so committed to the idea that we had this mutual friend that he would not, like I eventually had to just give up and be like, yeah, man, it's great that we both know this person. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> it's like, good meeting you, right? And so that's part of the story too, was that, that even though I at various points was like, I think we're talking about different Maries. The Marie I know moved back to the States. You know, and he's like, no, 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 she lives in Lichtenberg or whatever. It's like there was this whole interesting moment where in that space, in that moment, it mattered more for him, right? That there was this moment of connection with a stranger. And it, that mattered more than actually the facts, right? Than the actual accuracy of what, what we were talking about. And then finally, the third story is me running across these two guys also in the um, in the kind of chill out room slash smoking area, uh, who were both, they had just moved up from Bavaria, from the south of Germany. Uh, they were both these like um, kind of young, Trying to think of you know how I describe them. If you imagine like sort of like punk hardcore kids, also like very young little twinks, um, you know, but like dressed up like hardcore kids, you know, but nonetheless at a club night, right? You know, so like, uh, with all the like dress of um, kind of you know uh, kids at a punk show, uh, but they are partying, but also extremely high from the sounds of things, uh, from the looks of things, and they just really wanted to talk, uh, and and so we did, and I was still learning German at that point. I was kind of practicing my German. So I was like apologizing as I was like slowly working through it. Um, and what really struck me in this moment was how committed they were to helping me have that interaction, right? That they actually were very patient. We had like a 20 plus minute conversation where I was slowly building my sentences and like conjugating the verbs. Yeah. And they would like offer, you know, words when I couldn't find them. Uh, and they weren't switching to English, which is for anybody who's lived in Germany, especially in Berlin, and if you tried to learn German, one of the struggles there is that enough folks speak enough very good English that if as, at the first sign of trouble, they just switch into English, you know, partially sometimes because they're helping you or they think they're helping you, but also sometimes because they're busy and frankly, they don't have the time for you, right? And so they will sometimes kind of aggressively switch into English and they're like judging you as they do it. And so it was just very interesting to have this experience where these two guys who had no reason to do this and clearly were busy having fun, they were clearly high, they had other things to do very literally, um, but were really committed to this like moment of interaction with this random stranger. So. From there, uh, and here again, I'm gonna look at the time. Yeah, perfect. So that's chapter four. That's already kind of more than halfway through the book. Chapter five, I spend some time uh, thinking about this this kind of process, if that's the right word, that I that I that I myself label coming undone, right? And coming undone was just kind of this way for me to make sense of how um, certain forms of like rough, intense experience are actually really valorized in my life, right? And the the best way that I explain this to folks is. Um, you know, from my own field work and also my own experiences, I mean, I realized that so often when people would be telling each other stories of like, oh man, I had such an amazing night out and we just had this like oh, legendary night with my friends, we went to this festival or whatever. And then the storytelling itself is just crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis, right? The story is like, this happened, we got lost, this person lost their phone, I got really sick, whatever, whatever. And then by the end of the story of just constant crises, then they're like, that was an amazing time. I had such a good time, right? So why is that, right? Like, why is it that that is a way that we, within a subculture at least, and I think in a lot of music subcultures, um, remember good times, right? How is it that, um, you know, not just smooth experience, and this is kind of how, how I use the, how I use theory in that chapter or kind of conceptual terms in that chapter to work it out, kind of propose that there are two kinds of experience, two textures of experience that happen a lot in nightlife, smooth experience where things go well um, and where things run smoothly and rough experience, which is, Interestingly, like in interviews, when I would propose this to friends, 
to friends and contacts and ask them, what do you think of this? All of them, you know, most of them would say things along the lines of like, yeah, um, I can see that. Yes, there's kind of both smooth, smooth and rough experience happening at a night, but I really want rough experience. Right. But or, or what they would say is things along the lines of what I value and what I remember, and what I enjoy are the rough experiences. But also realistically, the whole night can't be that. Right. And so they'll, they'll have we would have these really interesting, complex conversations, all of which are in chapter five. I'm going to read it um, where they will talk about, like, how do you balance the that that mix of, of smooth and rough as the night goes on? And what are, like, why? Why do we enjoy that? Why? What, what are what kind of, you know, why are you getting off on the rough experience? Right. Like what's useful or, or productive and especially what's pleasurable or enjoyable about that? Uh, and that's where I get to this idea of coming undone, that one of the things, one of the pleasures of going out and nightlife in general um, is these opportunities to put yourself through a bit of pressure, a little bit of torsion in ways that that allow you to come undone, right? that allow whatever is your identity and your person, particularly the kind of the kind of identity that you have to keep together in everyday life, right? The, the kind of identity that you have to present to the world that's coherent and stable. You know, part of what nightlife offers is a release from that, a temporary bit of relief from that. And that can certainly feel like a relief, especially, and again, this comes back to the whole irony of some of these things for, for marginalized folks. You know, for folks who experience a lot of marginalization around their identities, it might feel like a real relief to have this moment of release from being all of that, right? Uh, and that coming undone can maybe give you some of that. Final main chapter thinks about um, inclusion and exclusion much more explicitly. And that here again, the, the scope is going from like dance floor originally to the whole kind of club to finally the door of the club and the exterior of the club as well. So this last chapter, I used to call it the bouncers and multiculturalism debate. Um, I now, I think the title for the chapter now is embedded diversity. That's kind of where I land at the end. But the whole point of this chapter is thinking about door policies at clubs, especially Berlin infamously is, is, is a city where um, there's not really much regulation in, in how clubs manage their doors. So most clubs will do just selection at the door, like straight up selection in the sense of you can be waiting for an hour in the queue and you get to the front and the bouncer or the door person might just see, look, people will be like, not tonight, buddy, see you later, right? Mm -hmm. And that's it. You can't, you can't negotiate. You can't like talk your way in. If they say no, you don't go in, right? Um, and there's, of course, lots of debates and polemic about like, you know, is this bad? Is this good? You know, does this allow you know, for a better, a better curated crowd on the inside, or it does, is this important and especially necessary, especially for queer nightlife spaces and maybe also POC nightlife spaces um, to, to kind of create a safer space on the inside by filtering out folks who might be a risk to people on the inside. But at the same time, very obviously you can imagine how, you know, when that process is happening in a totally opaque way where you don't have any transparency about why decisions are being taken, uh, and when it's being framed around like managing risk and safer spaces and so on, you can ask the question, how do these people make decisions about who's potentially a violent risk, right? Who's potentially a homophobia risk? Who's potentially a misogyny risk? Especially when most of the people making these decisions are white Germans uh, and most of the, you know, most of their absorbed ideas about how do you visually assess threat and especially visually assess things like risk of misogyny and, and homophobia or whatever and queer phobia is are they brown are they male are they working class right mm -hmm. you know and any combination of those things right so obviously racism and classism are in this right and in berlin especially but also other cities have this and i'm sure all of you you know have experience or at least have heard of experiences of folks being excluded from nightlife, nightlife spaces you know because they are to something right you know or because in you in the U.S. and in Canada, it's more often dress codes that are only enforced for brown and black folks, right? You know, uh, or other ways that excuses are found to say like, nah, actually you can't come in, right? Um, so that chapter deals with that, and in particular, it thinks through how you land with. Um, it, it tries to make sense of how, nonetheless, especially in Berlin, you do get like once you get into these clubs, even though yes, you're aware of that and you hear stories of racist store policies and classist store policies and so on, you get into the club and like lo and behold, it is this like very nice diverse crowd. There's lots of different people on the dance floor, different ethnicities and races present, different like a broad, uh, usually like a nice, a nice selection, a nice variety of like gender presentation and sexuality and so on. But my whole point is that it's all curated, right? That like. That is part of what these dorm folks do. It's that they, they know themselves that if they create a crowd that is just like upper middle class, straight, hetero, white folks, um, that that is, you know, on the one hand, going to create a very uninter uninteresting, unexciting 
uh, space on the inside. And, and a lot of the people who are coming out or going out to party are not going out for that, right? That like part of what they are delivering is this kind of like happy mix of people, right? Um, but to deliver that happy mix of people, they do lots of filtering and selection about who they think is not right for that mix, right? And also how many of each kind of person they wanted the dance for, right? And then certainly there aren't that many bouncers who go on the record to talk about this for obvious reasons. But if you get to talk to some of them informally, they will talk about this, that there are kind of informal quotas in their heads about, you know, how many, like what's the balance of different ethnicities, sexualities, and so on. Often they will say this is to protect queer spaces, for example, not too many straight folks, that sort of a thing, right? And those, again, those can be understood, right? That like, the hetero gentrification of queer nightlife spaces is a thing, like it happens and we lose nightlife spaces that way, right? Um, and similarly, if you've had access to, you know, for example, predominantly, uh, you know, black centered or Hispanic Latino centered nightlife spaces, and they get too much exposure and suddenly a lot of green girls are showing up, that also kind of ruins the vibe. Like that is, that is an issue, right? So like, it's a complicated question, complicated issue. And what is interesting for me is how curation is kind of a way to understand what's happening there as both a good and a bad thing, right? Or as a thing that is useful, but really is a double-edged sword. So finally, let me look at the time here. Okay. So finally, I want to spend a little bit of time with this um, with this closing anecdote. I'm not going to read the whole anecdote itself. In the epilogue, which is pretty short, like compared to the other chapters, it's just a few pages. The first part of the epilogue, I do what is much more kind of typical structural writing for the end of an academic book, where I review the main arguments that I've made across the whole book. And I kind of summarize each of the chapters and I connect them all to, I, I use one anecdote. And again, this is very like anthropology stereotype. I have another fieldwork anecdote that I use as an encapsulating example to show like, look, you can read this anecdote through the ideas from chapter one, the ideas from chapter two, the ideas from chapter three, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, that is kind of one half of the epilogue. And it's kind of like the formal or structural ending to the book. And then the last, the other half of the epilogue is me thinking about the Pulse Orlando massacre, right? And, and in particular, the framing there is around what I call public intimacy. And I call this, I'm of course, borrowing from and it's inheriting from Warren Berlant in particular as a, a, a scholar of intimacy in the queer history, um, or kind of queer theory, uh, queer studies, um, around, around kind of finding ways to talk about um, belonging, you know, kind of publics in the sense of belonging, uh, belonging to an audience, belonging to a public sphere that is intimate in the sense that what, what allows you to belong to that group or to that sphere is something intimate about your life, right? So something about your kind of emotional history, maybe something about, you know, your identity, your sexuality. Um, you know, the example that Lauren Berlant used to, to, to develop this idea is the whole concept of women's culture as a thing that developed in the 19th century, where the presumption and kind of what was being presented to women, and this of course is at a time when um, the idea was to create a consumer category, right? Of like to buy magazines, to buy objects, to you know, to go to new movies and and so on. Around the idea of a separate cultural area that is specifically for women. Um, but how do you manage that belonging when you know black women, Latino women, upper class women, lower class women, uh, sex workers, and so on will all have really different experiences of being a woman, right? Like how do they then all cohere to this this label? Uh, and a lot of it is through maintenance. It's through being incoherent. Um, and it is through a, an appeal to affect, to emotion, to intimate intimacy. The idea, again, what Berlant would argue is that how that works is by implying that if if you have lived life as a woman, the emotional affective experience of that is enough for you to belong to this public. And in fact, we're not going to ask many more questions beyond that, right? It's just having emotionally been through it is enough to be part of this community, right? So a similar thing, <coughs> excuse me, was happening. Um, for me, at least, I found uh, happening in the process of mourning uh, publicly, right, around the Pulse Orlando shooting, and especially Latinx or Latina um, queer nightlife, right, and 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 those communities, right. Um, so for me, what was interesting in those days afterwards, even the few hours after that happened, was there was this outpouring on the internet, so social media, and then eventually blog posts and short journalism pieces by predominantly Latina, uh, queer Latina folks talking about how that club saved me when I was a teenager. You know, I didn't go to that, that club, but I went to other clubs in my city and they saved my life. They let me live, you know, they allowed me, uh, you know, or like they, this meant so much to me, right? So all these ways in which people were doing these public forms of testimony, these public forms of mourning, 
around yeah. their identity, their sexuality, and so on, and how these all connected to um, this idea of not just of belonging, but kind of belonging in public, right? So from there, and hold on, we'll see, how, how much time do we have left here? Just a couple of minutes. So I was, I am gonna read still a little bit from um, not necessarily the text text itself, but from um, a, like a stream, a Twitter thread essentially. So this is this is all quoted verbatim in the, in the text. This was by, um, uh, I'm not mistaken, this was a woman, an older generation uh, lesbian woman who was on Twitter, I think a law scholar technically, uh, you know, and she, yeah, she herself described herself as quote unquote an aging dyke. Uh, and she posted this kind of a Twitter rant to the youngins, right? To the baby gays, essentially, just within hours of this happening. Uh, it's very emotional, so a little bit of a content warning. It's not graphic, but it is quite emotional. I'm gonna read about as much of it as I can in the time that I have left. But what's really interesting and pay attention to as you hear this is how through a whole bunch of tweets, she does all this historical work uh, and she does a whole bunch of communication that's also intergenerational queer communication um, around this tragedy, right? So here she says, I'm an aging dyke. And so I'm just going to get this out of my system. Kids, y'all 35 and under, this wasn't supposed to happen to you. The generation ahead of us knocked down the walls, stonewall. Initial visibility, standing proud, being out, they suffered the consequences. Backlash, violence, the upstairs lounge in New Orleans, that was the previously the most deadly attack on, uh, I think, of, of any sort of any kind of mass attack, but specifically on a queer nightlife space before Pulse, right? So backlash, violence, the upstairs lounge in New Orleans, guns fired at the places they dared to gather. Then AIDS swept in and devastated the community. Reagan and his ilk laughed at our center. Right? They closed ranks, they cared for one another, tended the dying and buried the dead. There's a reason why most 60 plus, 60 year old and more gay leaders are women. See the genocide underneath the demographics. Then the mid nineties, antiretroviral drugs came along. Our men started surviving. We began to flourish, to stand up, to stand out more strongly. With every step of progress came backlash, but we pushed and we pushed. And there weren't any upstairs lou lounges, no Matthew Shepherds, if you remember Matthew Shepherd. But we were winning. Then, Pulse, 50 dead, 50 wounded. Babies, kids, the ones we fought so hard to protect from the backlash. We never wanted you to know about this. We never wanted you to experience this. It's why we fought and fight so hard. It permeates our society. It is so much better than it was, yet remains so awful. And this is in 2016, so she had no idea what was coming, right? Um, it's why our generation kept fighting and keeps fighting. But it's time for our generation to teach the next. Welcome to the fight for your lives, kids. We're with you. We'll guide you. The world is not a safe space, and it only gets safer when you fight like hell for it. We weren't given the spaces we had. We'll still take a bullet for you, literally and figuratively. You were just never supposed to have to take a bullet for us. And so that's the end of the stream, or of the, the thread there. It continues on after that as well. Um, but that's the part that I quote here. Let's take a look at the time. Almost perfect. Um, so I'll, I'll come to kind of a landing point in this. Without reading anything more from the book, there's one little kind of coda, a little end after this, right? So I, I read through this, this tweet stream, I unpack it, there's a bunch of other stuff that I, I say more broadly, uh, or that I argue more broadly about queer public mourning, right? Kind of mourning for queer lives, especially brown queer lives, um, you know, and insisting that brown queer lives are to be mourned, right? That we are worth mourning. All these things are, are things that are happening in the public sphere in this moment, in a way that didn't happen before, right? Like that was part of what's interesting was the brief moment where it wasn't just, you know, queer Latina folks saying this to each other, but they were doing it in public spaces, in public venues where the rest of the world could read it, right? Uh, the final kind of closing, closing bit uh, here is where I reflect actually on the lyrics from a particular techno song called Transition, which is about making life transitions, but also can be reread re as, you know, a bit of a trans anthem as well. Um, and in the, that closing section, I reflect a little bit on actually the shooter himself over Mateen and how there was a whole set of rumors at the time, right, when, when this happened, that he was closeted, that, you know, he was attacking this club because he used to go there before and he, you know, he was always getting kind of rejected sexually. Um, afterwards, the police much later came out and said there was no evidence of him ever going to the club. There's no evidence of him being on any of the gay dating apps. There was no gay porn on his forum on his phone, blah, blah, blah. But nonetheless, locally in the community, there were a lot of folks who were un, like, just deeply convinced that this had to be part of the story, was that he was, um, that he was 
a, a you know notably specifically a QT pop like you know queer trans person of color right a brown person who was who had some aspect of his sexuality that was queer uh, and who was going to spaces like Pulse and not experiencing inclusion right actually experiencing rejection and marginalization and that that actually poisoned him so deeply that he eventually turned to violence right again. Is that really what happened? We do not know. There's certainly no evidence for it. But what's more interesting to me and how I kind of close this off is how that was such a compelling narrative for the other Latino folks in the community who were trying to make sense of why did this happen to us, right? That that was a story that made sense to them. And that tells us a lot about how queer nightlife spaces for folks of color um, are always two things, right? They're always spaces of escape and spaces of refuge and so on, and spaces where the racism that we experience in everyday life follows us inside, right? Uh, and that that's part of the experience of being, a, uh, at least I would argue in this closing, part of the experience of being queer trans and of color in some sense or racialized in some sense is coming to terms with that, right? coming to terms with that, with that contradiction or that, that friction, you know, of the spaces that you and your community have often designed to, to, you know, to protect you or to give you an escape, to give you a break from the shit of the world is also still a place that can, where the shit of the world will find you sometimes, right? And, and that is a different kind of utopianism than what is often described around nightlife utopias. So with that, we'll stop there. Thank you so much, everybody, for your time and for your patience. Thank you. So I, I know um, many of us have class until 5.15, so we still have time for Q&A, but I know um, everybody can give an applause to Chris for helping us. Thank you, Chris, for helping us. Um, but I know you have to pack up around 5, right? So you don't have to pack up. All right. So we can do a Q&A then um, with some of the streaming. And um, whoever asks, we have 10 books. So if we get 10 questions, I can... I can nice. give you a book. That's a good way to do it. Incentivize right? them to ask questions. <laughs> um, and I might suggest since we don't have the microphone, that you'll come up here, you'll ask the question near the the camera microphone, and then I can hand you the book. So nice. Um, like this. Do you want to feel the question? Sure. Here? All right. Sure. Yeah, come on up. Come on up. Ask your question. I really want a book. So uh, <laughs> yeah. this is, I, I like this character situation. Uh, so come oh, on up. Yeah. Thank you. What's the question? Hi, I'm Raquel. Uh, my question would be like, how do you think current tensions are rising, like regarding sexual assault and things? How do you yeah. think that that has changed current EDM culture? And how do you think that those advances that you're talking about have changed within the time that you read, uh, wrote this book and currently? Great, thank you. So, thank you so much for that. Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, you may be seated now. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So like, just to kind of reiterate the question a little bit, just to make sure that um, it's people out, uh, in streaming land can hear it, right? This question of how things changed with increasing discourse, right? Around the capital D discourse around sexual assault in EDM spaces and on dance floors. Um, so I think importantly, those experiences have always been there, right? And so I think for me, as somebody who's been through this scene since the nineties, it, it is only a net good that we're having conversations about sexual assault on the dance floor and harassment um, you know, a lot of these experiences will just be invisibilized and people will be gaslit out of, you know, kind of seeking accountability or, 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 or justice when these things happen to them. Um, you know, and I think that it's part of a larger shift that we've been seeing in EDM of centering out, right? And that we're not um, making the way into like, music scene journalism but also there was an interesting shift in like the, the electronic music journalism that was happening in the 2010s uh, and i was kind of part of it a little bit in 2013 i wrote i wrote a piece that did kind of go viral for um uh, an electronic music platform called resident advisor around trying to rewrite the history of sexuality and dance music pointing out that as the, the edm boom was happening in 2010 there was a lot of whitewashing and hetero washing of dance music history right that like for a lot of folks who are new to EDM, if you didn't, if if somebody wasn't writing a piece like I was trying to do, saying like, don't forget the history, it was easy for folks to get into EDM in that moment and just presume that it's most, it's a predominantly white genre and it's mostly like bros, right? Um, and that is not historically what it's been, right? So the, so that there was a shift happening in the 2010s where other also other folks were writing pieces um, for, for music journalism where they were pushing to talk more openly about yes, the history of electronic music before the EDM boom. But in that same moment, 
there was also a shift towards people saying like, we need to talk about sexual harassment, and sexual assault. You know, if we're going to start using and appropriating the language of safer spaces and safe, you know, dance floors and safe spaces, we got to take that seriously. Like that's where we're making a bunch of promises that we're not equipped to keep yet, right? Uh, and so I've been seeing this as a positive over overall, but also, yes, of course, that has meant more difficult conversations, right? About who gets to have the unproblematic experience on the dance floor, who has to spend a lot more of their time at a party fending off harassment, fending off, you know, groping hands, right? You know, who, you know, who's night, and this kind of circles back to the closing, the closing thing from the book, right? Who gets to go into these nightlife spaces and 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 you know not have to have their defenses up, right? And not have to be ready for these sorts of experiences. Uh, and that that maps a lot to you know to privilege and and to identity marginalization for sure. Yeah, thank you for that. Account. Other questions? Yes, please. I do have a question. May yeah. I take it? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll I'll repeat. I don't know you're, if you're, you're close enough to the microphone. Yeah. So we'll... I don't know if I'm close enough to the microphone. But um, I wanted to ask you, um, well, first of all, it was nice to meet you in person. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will let you know what have, what have you been inspired in writing this book in lubricated in connections between uh, the dance and music uh -huh. and and how did how did um, how did it stick for so for so long? that you really wanted to write a topic about. I see, I see what you mean. Um, so honestly, you know, I when I came into my PhD, so, you know, this book comes out of a PhD project, right? So this is my dissertation reworked into a monograph. Um, when I was applying for PhD programs, I was just very broadly and generally saying, I want to do a project on electronic music culture, right? And a grave culture, and I'm from that culture and I want to write about it. And I didn't have, I didn't yet have the topic around stranger intimacy, even though I knew already that that was a thing that was important to me and my experience of dance music culture, I didn't yet think that that was a thing anybody was interested in hearing about, or I wasn't even sure that, I wasn't thinking that that was a topic that was like meaty enough or complex enough to be developing into a full dissertation, certainly. So I was just building, I thought, you know, when I started my PhD, I just knew I wanted to write about dance music, you know, rave culture, and I hadn't yet figured out what was going to be the theme, the framing, the, you know, all of those things. And then, in many ways, this is just you know part of a story. I, I feel like I, I'm always telling a version of the story that a lot of my path to where I am now was not quite accidents, but me colliding with other things, right, in, in various ways. So I took a PhD level seminar with Lauren Berlant, who I was just quoting extensively or mentioning extensively. Um, I took a course with them at the University of Chicago on the quote um, intimate public sphere. This whole concept of public sphere and intimacy, um, and I would just like my mind, my little mind was blown in that seminar. We read all sorts of super interesting stuff. I was really inspired by a lot of what we were writing, reading and, and thinking about. And that course was, it was an English lit course. We were reading completely different things. Um, there was like nothing around nightlife per se, but I wrote my term paper on um, a nightlife venue in Toronto, actually not a dance, um, not an electronic music party, but a queer punk night in Toronto that I, that I used to really love called Vaseline. Um, and, uh, I got great feedback on that, but also just in the context of that, I came out of it thinking a lot about intimacy and realizing, oh, using intimacy as a focus, especially intimacy in spaces where you wouldn't expect, like where you weren't conventionally um, kind of taught to expect it, right? Like all of our con conventional definitions of intimacy, and I really explore that a lot in chapter one and two, you know, we're kind of taught culturally that intimacy is the thing that happens between people who have long-standing relationships. Intimacy is associated with things like the couple form, marriage, um, family ties, you know, stable, stable social structures, all these sorts of things. So we're in some ways primed to understand stranger intimacy as a, as a contradiction, right? Or at least as really counterintuitive and maybe just a euphemism for like casual sex or something. So especially in queer, queer subcultural context where lots of you know, like sexual friendship and sex as kind of, you know, like not just necessarily a deep relational thing, um, kind of intersects with that, right? Or flows over with that, that for me seemed like a, a, a thing to explore, right? Like, are there ways for us to think about intimacy and stranger intimacy or kind of light touch surface intimacy in these in these contexts in ways that are not pathologizing, 
in ways that are not stigmatizing and, and in ways that kind of just take seriously, like, yeah, this is also a kind of intimacy, right? Um, and it's real and it happens. And it's not just, and it's not just performative. It's not just like, a, I guess, of course, obviously people can perform intimacy and pretend to or whatever, but that the, I think for a large part of what I was responding to in the whole project was, um, you know, early on when I was first developing the project and talking to my classmates, like people who weren't into the techno scene or into rave culture, you know, I'd say I'm, I'm interested in like stranger intimacy in these scenes, you know, and their initial response would just would be like, well, don't you just mean that everybody's high and that's why, right? You know, or like, don't you just mean that they're like really drunk or or whatever? Like the presumption was the intimacy is there, but it's not real. It's not really, like, you know, there, there was always a cynical reading, right? Of nightlife, especially for people who are not from the nightlife world, right? That clearly there's no way that you could genuinely be having meaningful intimacy with strangers. Clearly you must be mistaken or clearly this must be a kind of a false consciousness based on being high, being drunk, being sexually interested, et cetera, et cetera. And so in many ways, this book and this project is me writing back to that or trying to find a way to have a, a more coherent kind of academic response to that, that set of presumptions around nightlife. Yeah, thanks for that. It's a great question. And enjoy your book. Thank yes, we have a question back here as well. Please come on up. Uh, or should we stand? Well, this is the camera, so if you're yeah. closer there, on the camera for a second, but just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> unless you want to take nearby. a seat. But... <laughs> yeah, you may also sit. If you like. That's all. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm an aspiring uh, popular music uh, musicologist. Fabulous. Uh, and I, I'd like to know. Uh, one short thing uh, before I get to like my main question. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's like an email or something uh, where I can communicate with you. Oh, of course. Yes. And um, I should have, should have said that earlier. The easiest thing for everybody um, who's interested. And also this is a, a place where you can download some of my like publications, not the book, sadly, but other things, including a very cute uh, queer underground uh, zine uh, is the Luis Garcia, T H E Luis Garcia dot card dot co. And it's C A R R D. If you know that like website card, Dot co that it's like Linktree, right? So it's one of those pages that gets you to a whole bunch of other pages um, or a whole bunch of other links. We can get maybe later, Dr. Vallejo, I can give you the, the, the website as well. Yeah. So in there, there's also my email address towards the bottom and contact info, all sorts of other things. So I would just send everybody there. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward to get a hold of me from there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And your question. Uh, my, yeah. My main question, uh, I guess, is uh, you mentioned having like field notes. I'm wondering. Yeah. Uh, what in particular, like how you decide is important enough to uh, write down and um, how often do you take notes? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So I was deeply influenced by a specific ethnographer. I mean, other folks as well I picked up from, but I was really inspired, inspired by a person who actually wasn't in anthro or ethnomusicology, but she was in performance studies at NYU. Um, her name is Fiona Buckland. And she wrote a book that came out, I want to say 2005, six, called Impossible Dance. Um, impossible Dance, dot, dot, um, queer world making in underground nightlife, something, 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 in Manhattan. Essentially, she did a project in Manhattan where she was studying anyways. Um, and she was, she, I think she was a grad student in the 90s. So part of what she was doing is capturing the end of Midtown Manhattan queer nightlife before the kind of Rudy Giuliani Disneyfication, right? Like, and, and part of her story is the process of that being extinguished, right? It's a, it's a really beautiful book, but also a really sad one in some ways. Um, and I read that as a grad student in particular, I was really like struggling to find examples of nightlife research, um, like ethnographic nightlife research. And she outlines a little bit of her methods in the intro, but then somewhere there's like a footnote. And if you go to the notes section at the back of the book, she actually fully describes her methods in great detail. And that one for me was super informative and inspiring because one of the things she did, uh, she did a lot of what she called, or what she, I don't know if she described it this way, but I definitely came to the term terms in this book, which also in the book, you'll find a discussion of this as well. Uh, what I called memory work in the sense of, if you want to take notes, from like a club experience. So, you know, the anecdote I read at the beginning of this, this presentation, I wasn't taking notes on the dance floor, obviously, right? For all sorts of reasons, practical reasons, but also it's like socially completely inappropriate to do that, right? You can't be in there with a camera either. Like in some clubs, they'll kick you out for that, but also just in most clubs, especially queer clubs, like why would you do that? That would be really invasive. Uh, so you have to rely on your memory, right? And so lots of decisions about, you know, I would often have to make a decision 
Like, is tonight a night where I'm in recording recording mode and I'm like, my brain is paying attention, right? And also I will be not consuming drugs or getting drunk or what have you. Like, I'll be more thoughtful and careful about my, my state, my mental state. Um, and then what I would do is as soon as I got home, I would take my notes. So I would be working from memory, but with memory that was still fresh, especially pre-sleep. That was really important. It's like, take the notes before you sleep. Um, I tried different ways and the detail... The loss of detail after the first round of sleep is actually pretty pretty remarkable. Um, and this is from this is from Fiona Buckley. So this is how Fiona Buckley would work. She would go to these clubs. She was mostly going to queer uh, Manhattan clubs. She'd get, be getting home at six or seven in the morning, like me as well. And then you would have to commit to doing like a brain dump as soon as you got home. And you would do the brain dump, or I would do the brain dump, just into like a document, like a Word doc file. Um, in point form in a totally disorganized manner. And then I would have to commit to myself the next morning when I got up to sit down and turn that into prose, right? So that was part of the process is like a brain dump of just details and um, fragments of conversations. I would usually use the the, the lineup, the DJ lineup um, to help me organize temporarily what happened in the, night, in the night. So if you're going to like a rock show where there's multiple bands, or if you're going to a party where there's, you know, like a drag show where there's multiple performers, that's one way for you in your memory to remember when things happened because you know they can get jumbled. So, but for me, I would like set up DJ played you know like this DJ, then this DJ, then this DJ. They were playing from like you know midnight to two, two to four, four to six, and then I would fill in just like point four and what what I remember happening when. Uh, and then the next morning, I would get up and I would turn all of that into into like consistent prose, like storytelling prose. And that version of the prose is almost exactly what ends up in the book, right? So like those fragments here are almost directly taken from the field notes in that form with like slight editing, obviously, especially to get in identifying details out. Um, and one thing that really helped me, but obviously not everybody can do this, um, during my field work, I maintained a field work blog that was partially because I was working on intimacy, public culture, public sphere. Like I thought it, it's relevant, it makes sense. It's coherent that I should experiment with actually publishing my field notes publicly, right? But to do that, obviously that meant that I was sanitizing the notes before yeah. I put them up on the blog, right? So I, I still had my own personal copy of things on, in a Word document where there was a lot more detail, including bits that were maybe very private. Um, and then I would turn that prose into something that was more publishable and sanitized with name changes and so on. But that exercise, especially as a grad student while I was in the field work, of uh, every day writing short pieces for the blog and then especially on the weekends when I was going out writing really long accounts of what I was what I was seeing and what I was doing was really good exercise in writing and like it helped me to then write the dissertation later on that I was just used I was capable of producing a couple thousand words in a night if I needed to right like that was great um, I don't have that skill anymore you know that's atrophied but it was really good <laughs> to have it then uh, but also doing all of that memory work uh, that was also kind of like a muscle so it took me a couple of weeks of doing two to three events per weekend of this kind of note taking before I could remember complete conversations the way that I, I do. Like in some of these anecdotes, there's like multiple back and forth verbatim quotes. And I was able to retain that because I was practicing this every weekend. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah, very helpful. That's Thank you. Cheers. Any other questions about more books? Yes, please come on up. Hi, Hi, uh, my question was, uh -huh. um, I think there's, well, there's feeling, the growing feelings of isolation with Gen Z. Sure. Yeah. Um, will that ever affect your medium spaces in the future, or is it affecting them now? Or yes, I would absolutely. So to, just to repeat that question to the to the audience at home, so to speak, um, you know, rising there's this broadly a broadly observed rise, rising sense of social isolation for Gen Zs, um, and is that reflected in dance music as well, right? Uh, already or, or will that be? And yes, the short answer is yes. Um, what I've been observing um, and as a little bit directly, but a lot more through other folks that I know in the Berlin scene, the Paris scene and the Chicago scene um, is that essentially that the pandemic had like played a really big role in that unsurprisingly, um, that there's a whole group of folks who would have come of age to go into club culture in 2020, 2021, 2022, who didn't and then had to wait. And so for some of them, they did eventually come into club culture, but transformed and, you know, having gone through trauma and having gone through a couple of years of being completely socially isolated. Um, but also there are folks for whom, who maybe didn't end up in club culture or didn't end up at least in the world of nightlife uh, 
just because they lost those years, right? Mm -hmm. So the dance music kind of scene in communities is going through these interesting transitions, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. On the one hand, excuse me, they certainly they bounced back from the full lockdown, right? Like, you know, the, there are events happening, there are clubs, there are festivals, but numbers as like attendance numbers are slow to, to come back. They're coming back, they're close, but they're, they're not what they used to be. There certainly is not that sense of growth that was happening from 2010 to 2020, right? Where it's like this huge boom, right? That boom is, is over. Um, and if anything, what I've experienced over the longer time scale for myself from the nineties to the early 2000s, 2010 to now, is that dance music has tended to go in about 10 year cycles of bubble and bust or like, you know, boom and bust. So the nineties was a big boom. And then 20, 2000, 2010 was like a, a, a kind of a bust. 2010 to 2020 seems to be another boom. This is my prediction, right? That like this next 10 years are more of a bust period. That doesn't mean that everything is over, right? But just that, like it's a quieter period where more things go underground. There are some benefits to that in the sense of less mainstream kind of appropriation, um, less of that kind of, you know, tourist vibes, you know, um, in the underground scenes, but it also means less resources, less money, and so on, all those things, less things to keep the, the scene afloat. Um, and that seems to be tough, or at least that intersects in, in difficult ways, when also we have this larger social um, kind of impact coming from the lockdown of um, lots of people having gone through multiple years of, of profound isolation. And then genera generationally for Gen Z folks in particular, having lost a few years of time when they are setting up, when they would normally have been setting up some of the, the relationships that would have carried them through to their adult years, right? Or into their late adult years. Because I think that's a thing as well that we don't talk about as much, or at least it hasn't been discussed as much kind of in an academic setting, but it's pretty clear that for a lot of folks who do get into dance music culture or any other kind of music subcultures, right? That you form a lot of really important connections, like social connections, but also things like to, like solidifying your identity and who you are and what you want in life. A lot of that stuff happens kind of late teens, early twenties, going into the mid twenties. Um, and so for those who do it through nightlife and through techno and through queer clubs and so on, um, having two to three years of that taken away, right? It's, it's going to leave an impact, right? That's going to leave a, a hole in some sense. So we're yet to see exactly what that looks like, but you know, that's my sense is that those two things are really interlinked um, and we're we're in the process of seeing the impact in, in nightlife. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Let's see, well, I know so, yeah. sometimes we should head out because of class, but Fine. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll try to answer things more uh, more efficiently as well. We can also like, maybe after this question, we can sort of break and then if people kind of filter out, we can head out other books and people want to yeah, talk I'm happy to hang out and informally okay. answer questions. Yeah, well. yeah. Uh, but we can probably wind down the 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 live stream as well for sure. Yeah, so, Chris, thank you so much. Uh, do you think that there's a difference in stranger intimacy depending on how filtered a club scene is? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so the question is like, is there a difference in, in levels of intimacy depending on how filtered the club scene is? And I don't know if there's like a like a linear relationship, like one to the other per se. Um, but definitely, when I look at different examples, uh, or when I think of specific like clubs that had different reputations and so on, there is there's definitely a perceived relationship. So in other words, that that folks within the scenes, especially scenes where there are, is a lot of door selection, um, you know, and not just door selection. I will say like also. There are other, other kinds of selection, which I do talk about in the book, um, and those have become maybe more important more recently, um, again, is, uh, you know, there are also maybe not nightclubs, but like queer collectives that do underground raves and like, you know, you know, bush raves and that kind of a thing where they're super selective in how they advertise, right? And they, they don't publicly advertise things, but they'll use telegram channels or that kind of a thing, right? So selective filtration, narrow channel, kind of instead of broadcast, narrow cast, that kind of a thing um, is another form of filtration, right? It's maybe a, what feels like a less problematic form of filtration than like somebody at the door saying, not you, you, right? But there's still that that kind of filtration, especially when that, that selectivity about how you advertise or like, you know, being choosy about who you tell where the party is and who you invite is still a form of selection. And that can still also be really exclusive, right? So in that context where there's lots of different ways, of, lots of different forms of filtration, um, there definitely is a perception that there is some kind of a increase in the quality of the crowd when it's highly selective. But at the same time, folks, at least within the nightlife scenes that I'm part of, 
are hyper aware and usually very critical and very negative of forms of filtration that they will perceive as the wrong kind of filtration. Right? Like often in the interviews that I'd have around these things, they would talk about this, that like, yeah, you know, we we don't want like class-based or like glamour filtration. We don't want people being filtered by like how well-dressed they are or like how rich they look. Um, but we do want filtration that keeps out the like misogynist assholes or the like, you know, gross creeps or the or the people who are going to like or the the like, you know, violent beatheads who are going to get really, really agitated and like start fights, right? Like so there is both of those things kind of in in circulation and flux, I think. But that's more the discourse than anything. It's harder to to know for certain, or it's harder to have kind of a more objective or evidence-based assessment of the relationship between filtration and the experience of the club, and especially the, the level of intimacy, right? But certainly, I would say, broadly speaking, exclusivity does tend to generate a sense of, in, of, of, of intimacy for those who are included, right? And then that then that's kind of where I land at the end of that chapter on boundaries and multiculturalism is like what's the there's like a weird ambivalent bargain there between exclusion and inclusion happening there and like what do we make of that as a subculture that's supposed to value the culture right yeah thank you for that all right how are we doing were there any questions on the chat that we should answer before well, yeah. signing out uh, there wasn't any okay, okay. <laughs> no questions from the chat that's fine <laughs> thanks for the last for watching all right um so do you want to round things down yeah, we might because you probably have to probably have to go right. Oh, I've seen you. I'm I'm, I'm good. <laughs> <You> sure. <laughs> All right. I mean, so we've got five more books, so we can so finish up. up the books and yeah, come up closer yeah, too. Come on up. If you have questions, I'll I'll be here. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can wind down the uh, the live stream. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.